Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home, we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. This is number 12 in Obsessed with Sex. How do we control ourselves in a world where sex is everywhere, all around us? Men are lured, women are lured. Uh, we're not talking about violent sex, rape, and enforced um, prostitution like some women are put in, but that's a terrible thing to get in. And it shows you, it shows you the end result of being obsessed with sex. Now, MSNBC has a special program where they pretend like they're answering the solicitors over the internet to have sex with teenagers, and they capture them. They have the transcripts of what they said. So you watch that on MSNBC, and you will see that men are the predators, and women are the ones who are the solicitors. There's also homosexual sex, male and female, bestiality and all of that, male and female. It's all there. We're living in Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's come to Proverbs 5 and verse 1, and let's see the warning that we are given here. Because you see, there is nothing that affects your mind, your emotions, your heart, and your health, and the way that you think, than the way that your sex life is. The more that it conforms to the Word of God, husband and wife loving each other, having wonderful sex and blessed of God, the better that your life will be. Where your life is one of wantonness, whoremongering, soliciting men, the worse that your life will be. And you have to look at the long haul. You have to consider the end. And you have to consider the things that take place. And go back and listen to all of the statistics that I covered on an earlier video cast concerning sexually transmitted diseases. So there it is. Good and evil, right and wrong. Love and hate. Proper emotions, wrecked emotions, wrecked lives. Disenchanted children. And more crime comes from those who end up in divorce or single mother families, because they're all going against God. We're going to see in a little bit, God says, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. Now, fornication there comes from the Greek porneia, which means sexual immorality. God wants you to have sex within marriage. God wants you to love your husband to love your wife, to love your children, to receive love from God. And this gives you strength. Strength of character, strength of resolve, strength of understanding. See, the commandments of God were given for a blessing for us. And they're not old-fashioned. They're right up to date. So here in Proverbs 5, let's see how the words of God, obeying God and his laws, work to our benefit. My son, attend to my wisdom and bow your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, that your lips may keep knowledge, for the lips of a wanton woman drip as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Oh yes, come, come. You see, once a woman gives herself over to that, then it's almost as if she cannot stop. Just like once a man gives himself over to being a whoremonger, it's almost as if he can't stop. It's almost if you have to prove by these illicit activities that it won't affect you, that I'm big and strong, that, hey, Medical science will help me out in case something goes wrong. Or if a woman gets pregnant, well, I can get a, an abortion, and that'll take care of the problem. 
You think murder added to adultery solves the problem? Remember what happened with King David? And the affair with Bathsheba? It ruined his life forever and his family's life forever, resulted in the murder of Bathsheba's husband, yet he was king, took advantage of the power. And of course, Bathsheba wasn't innocent. Where was she bathing? On top of the roof of her house while her husband was gone, right where she knew the king would walk and see her. So when the king sent the servant, bring that woman to me. She said, yes, I'll go with you. I want to meet the king. So you see, lust and illicit sex can entrap men and women into desperate circumstances with horrible penalties that come. Now notice what it says here in verse 4. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of the grave. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. You cannot know them. Always emotional. Always trying to get, trying to take, trying to conquer. And oh, yes, one of the things that women of the street or of the evening like to have. They'd like to get a man for the first time. What a conquest. And you know, when the women of this kind of affair get together, you know what they talk about? How their affairs were with this man and that man and the other man. Even Princess Di talked over with some of her friends about her escapades with other men and who was better than the other one. So you see, once you get involved with that kind of thing, you have to justify everything that you do. But it's never going to work out. So here's what God says. Now, therefore, hear me, O you children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your ways far from her, and do not come near the door of her house. Flee fornication. Flee sexual immorality. That's what we are to do. And in the Bible, there's only one man who really did that, actually two. One was Joseph, and because he ran from a seductive woman who was his boss's wife, she brought false accusations and he was thrown in prison. And the other one was Job, who said concerning sexual immorality, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon those maidens. You might try that. Make a covenant with your eyes. All you men who look every time there comes a woman, who look at everything where a woman is semi-exposed and cleavage is hanging out, you make a covenant with your eyes and turn your head and not look. And the women need to ask themselves, why do I have cleavage down to my navel? and my skirt length clear up to the top of my thighs. What do you think you're doing? God says here, verse 8, Remove your ways far from her. Do not come near the door of her house, lest you give your honor unto others and your years unto the cruel. Now, I remember as, as a young man growing up, I saw a man who had great, huge, giant knuckles with arthritis, and he was addicted to smoking. And he would put his cigarette in his mouth and his hands were shaking and he'd get this wooden match and he'd he'd strike it on the matchbox and it would like it and it would he would light his cigarette and puff on it and he was all withered and wrinkled and and I I was just like about ten years about twelve years old at that about ten years old at that time. And I asked my mother, I said, How come he's that way? She told me, he went with the wrong people and got syphilis. No, she didn't tell me what everything that that meant, but I remembered syphilis. So he had arthritic syphilis, just like it says here, verse 11, and you moan when your end comes, and your flesh and your body are consumed. And you sit there and think about this in the twilight years of your life and think about all the 
difficulties and problems that you have had, and your body racked with various diseases. Verse 12, and you say, How I hated instruction, how my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teacher, nor inclined my ears to those who taught me. Hasn't that happened to a lot of people? Haven't a lot of people gone through that? Yes, indeed. So here's what he says, verse 15. Here are the instructions of God. Drink water out of your own cistern and running water out of your own well. Let your fountains be dispersed abroad as rivers of water into the streets. Let them be only your own and not strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. That's the instruction of God. Love each other. Cling to each other. Because in the beginning, Jesus said, God created them male and female, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh to build a life based on love. That doesn't mean you aren't going to have troubles and ups and downs, but work them out. Bring children into the world. And God says, you can share in my creation with me and bring children into the world after your own kind, like you. Isn't that a tremendous thing? Yes, it is. That's what God wants you to have, see? Let her be as the loving deer and pleasant doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and be ravaged always with her love. Not the love of a strange woman. Not with a man or a woman who is pretending and lying, being unfaithful. How can you ever trust someone who's unfaithful? How can you ever trust someone who breaks the bond of marriage by committing adultery. That's why God says, marriage is unto death, through thick and thin, through want or wealth, through richer or poor, in sickness or in health. That's what marriage is all about. God will bless you. God will watch over you. Now let's come to the New Testament and see some of the instructions of the Apostle Paul and see how God wants us to not get involved in those illicit sex activities. The church at Corinth, so let's go to 1 Corinthians, because Corinthians were known for their licentious lifestyle. And even one man in the church was having sexual relations with his stepmother. So, you know, it's not restricted to just people who are not associated with Christianity. And Paul had to say, put him out of the church. What are you doing putting up with this kind of evil among you? And you're saying, oh, is it? Oh, my, we're understanding. No, Paul says, get rid of him. Now, all of those sins can be repented of, but when they're repented of, you don't go back and repeat them. It's like Jesus told the man who had this terrible affliction for 38 years after he healed him, he said, go and sin no more. Or like the woman in John the 8th chapter who was caught supposedly in the act of adultery and brought to Jesus and said, Master, Moses commanded in the law that one who commits adultery should be stoned. What do you say? So he stooped down on the ground and he wrote. And everyone was wondering, what did he write? There are many speculations, but I believe what he was writing was, where is the man? Because you can't commit adultery alone. And the command in the Old Testament was that both of them would suffer the death penalty. So it wasn't a matter of forgiveness of that woman. It was a matter of that they sought to pervert judgment by only bringing the woman and not bringing the man. 
wonder who the man was. Maybe he was one of the Pharisees sent on a mission to deliberately entrap the woman so other Pharisees could grab her and take her to Jesus and say, now what do you say? So then he stood up and said, the one who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So they all left beginning with the elder ones down to the younger and finally there were no accusers. And Jesus looked at the woman and said, Woman, is there no man to condemn you? She said, No man, Lord. He said, Neither do I, because it was an improper judgment. But what did he say to her? Go and sin no more. When you come to God and you ask for forgiveness for these sins, you ask forgiveness for this behavior, you ask God to cleanse your mind, and it's something you're going to have to do repeatedly. Oh, Lord, cleanse my mind of these thoughts. Cleanse my mind of these experiences. Help me to come to you. Lift my life out of the depths. Give me strength to overcome. Heal my emotions. Heal my thoughts. Help me to guard the door of my mind. Help me to make a covenant with my eyes. Let me be faithful and loyal and loving to my wife, to my husband. Let us have the proper relationships. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because he wanted everyone to know that you cannot be a Christian and you cannot enter into the kingdom of God if you are living in sin. So he said, verse 9, Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor abusers of themselves as women, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You can't do it. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a double-mindedness. And I, I, for the life of me, have a hard time figuring out how some of these evangelists, and I know of one personally, that admitted that he had over 200 women while he was a preaching evangelist. wonder what he thought when he went home, saw his wife, saw his kids. Wonder what he thought every time he snuck off with another woman. Did he think, I'm an evangelist, nothing will touch me? Oh, well, God f will forgive me just like an evangelist now is starting a brand new church after about a, a two and a half year rehabilitation for I involving himself with homosexual men. Oh, I'm forgiven, I'm starting a new church. Really? I wish you well. I hope you do good. But you better get right with God, not only sexually, but you better get right with God concerning the Sabbath and Sunday and holidays or holy days or Passover or communion. Unless you're willing to forsake those, all the forgiveness that you may derive will not be worth anything. So he says, it's, it's not going to work out if you live a life that way. Now, here's how they were going to go ahead and solve the problem of sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Now concerning the things that you wrote to me saying, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Oh, stay away. Don't get near. Don't touch a woman. That's how you're to avoid sexual immorality. No, because that doesn't stop lust. Verse 2, Paul says, rather to avoid sexual immorality, which comes from the word porneia, from which we derive the English word pornography. To avoid sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. And have all the sex you need, blessed by God, loving your wife the wife loving her husband. Not something? That's what God wants. Free and clear conscience. No hang-ups. No worry about sin. 
Don't worry about sexually transmitted diseases. See, the solution is in the Bible all the time, see? And let the woman have her own husband, and then honor the marriage vows. Verse 3, let the husband render his conjugal dues to his wife, in the same way also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have power over her own body, but the husband, in the same way also, the husband does not have power over his own body, but the wife. That's God's solution. Now, this picture is a great and a wonderful thing. This picture is Christ and the church. Let's come to here to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, just a few pages over, and let's see what it says about husbands and wives. Verse 25, here's how God wants it to be. Here's the pattern that we need for our lives. And believe me, in marriage, there has to be lots and lots and lots of forgiveness. Because marriage is going to have its ups and its down, it downs, and you have to be forgiving of each other. But don't get involved in such a way that you have so many problems that you think, well, I'll go out and solve my problems and find another woman or find another man, and you end up creating more gigantic problems, you see. No, take the course of God. Solve your problems together. Forgive each other. Love each other. Kiss and make up. All right, let's pick it up here, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Of the wives, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Because God designed it that way. Christ is the head of the church. The husband is the head of the woman. God made it that way for a special purpose. Husband, love your wives in the same way that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And that's what husbands are to do. They are to work. They are to provide. They are to give stability. They are to give leadership. They are to ha have wisdom and knowledge and understanding by studying the Word of God. And they are to love their wives. Now, can you, can you have anything better than that? loving each other, living God's way, living with God's protection, living with the understanding that you need, living knowing that God is blessing you, watching over you, bless you with children, bless your children. There's not something, that's what God wants. Now notice, verse 26, so that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. See, because marriage pictures the ultimate relationship for all eternity for the church and Christ. Think of that. That's why God designed marriage the way that he did. Now, verse 27, that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that it might be holy and without blame. In the same way, husbands are duty-bound before God to love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. And the wife is not to try and usurp authority over a man and treat him like a dumb dolt, like is shown today on most television. See? And also, men, educate yourself so you're not a dumb dolt. Needs to be both ways. Now, Hebrews 13. Let's go there. Here's a scripture which is really a, a, a good scripture, which we really need to understand and apply. See, these are the basic things that God has given. And the way you have a happy marriage is love each other and resolve your problems continually. Verse 4, Hebrews 13. Let marriage be held honorable by all, and the marital union be undefiled. For God will judge fornicators and adulterers. That's what God wants. Now, that is the solution in your life, living in an obsessed with sex generation. 
But you have to guard your eyes, guard your mind, guard what you hear, guard what you see, and do not be taken into temptation. Do not let lust pull you away. Love each other. Have your sex in marriage, that it be a blessing. That's God's way. That's why he has given marriage right at the beginning, as we saw, that a man shall leave his, fa his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's why there are all the warnings concerning adultery, men and women. That's why are there the things in the Bible to give us direction and where we need to go. So let your life be blessed. You have troubles in your marriage? Work them out. Do you have difficulties you need to overcome? Repent and ask for God's help. And by all means, study the Bible, learn these things, live God's way, and God will bless you in everything that you do, regardless of what's going on in the world. So thank you for inviting me into your home, and I hope that these messages on Obsessed with Sex will help you straighten out your life and learn and know God's way even more. Once again, please use our other website, cbcg.org, and download the sermons that we have there, which will teach you in-depth understanding concerning the Word of God. So this is Fred Coulter saying, until next time, so long, everyone. 